Welcome to the Kickstart Podcast, where we highlight the stories of how professionals kickstarted and navigated their very successful careers. My name is Preston, and on this episode, we have the pleasure of hosting someone who has an impressive career where he first got his degree from MIT in both physical electrical engineering, later worked as a developer, and then founded Floating Point Group, a fintech company in the cryptocurrency space. John, thank you so much for being on the show. Well, Preston, it's incredible to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And trust me, that is a much more glowing introduction than I probably deserve in any way. It is absolutely my pleasure. So I think a fitting way to start is, first and foremost, just ask you. So for those that are just unfamiliar with who you are, would you just mind sharing a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm more than happy to. So I'm John. So I was actually born in Michigan, uh, in Detroit City. Uh, so, so, So I do listen to a good amount of Eminem, I guess that means. I grew up actually then in Missouri, so in Springfield, and then I went to school, as you mentioned, at MIT. Uh, so at MIT, I did a lot of work around data analysis, data prediction. Effectively, we were doing fun things like sticking electrodes to people's brains and trying to understand what are they dreaming or what are they thinking about. Numbers were just numbers, so I started doing some of that in the finance space too, exploring how we can study and understand patterns and trends across stocks and equities and finances. Did that for a couple of years, which is me and a couple of friends of mine. And then I was coming into being, going into graduate school. And a friend of mine was like, come take a look at this crypto thing. And after six months of telling me to do it, uh, I finally jumped in with them. And that was back in 2018. We went through an accelerator hosted by the school actually called Delta V. Amazing program if I ever could recommend it. We did that. We graduated that program at the end of 2018. We tried all of our might to raise a bunch of money and start a massive company. And we raised a little bit of money and we hired a couple of people to make a very small company. And we were kind of all living out of the basement of an apartment in New York City. Uh, And then slowly we got more and more clients. And slowly we started working with bigger hedge funds, asset managers, token projects across crypto, started expanding the company. We raised a seed round in 2020, raised a series A in 2021. We now support connections to over 50 people. We have a pretty cool marketing department that is now willfully spooling out our story to the world. Uh, and, and that's been really amazing to see. And yeah, now the company is really amazing. And so you know, what Floating Point Group is and what we do is effectively we serve in the prime brokerage space in crypto, where we help people with agency OTC execution, as well as settlement and prime financing. So we have about 40 people here in New York, a little bit in California, and a little bit over in Singapore. And honestly, it's just been an incredibly journey every day. John, that was an amazing high-level summary. And uh, just hearing you share your story uh, makes me want to ask you a ton of questions. So I would love to talk a little bit, of course, a lot more about Floating Point Group, which is their current company. But just taking a step back, I'm just honestly curious how... Uh, I, I know that, um, as I mentioned before, you graduate MIT in physics and electrical engineering. Is that something that you've always wanted to do? Were you always like a science or data guy even before college? And that's why you ended up at a very technical focused college like MIT? I'm just curious about your story. It's funny you say that. I would not say that I am smart. I think I am much too pragmatic for mm-hmm. academia. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, when I went to MIT, I was baffled at the intelligence of so many of my peers, Mm -hmm. people that had won, you know, gold medals in the Olympics 14 times over for their mathematical prowess. And I was very impressed and awed by them. And I don't think I was ever particularly good at that. I think what I was good at is uh, just, let's say, doing work and doing brute force work. So, for instance, when I applied to college, I'll never forget, I actually made an Excel spreadsheet with every activity that I ever did, like 100 or 200 activities, and I gr- grouped it based on the attribute of my personality that I wanted to display. And I effectively made sure that make sure that I was well-rounded and holistic and all this, uh, not because I was probably those things, but because I just structured it to make sure that those things were apparent. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, I, I think I am fascinated by data. I love data analytics. We have a research team at FPG now. I do a lot of work with them. Uh, but 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 I would not say that I am particularly adept at. I'd say I'm a little bit more just pragmatic. Ah, don't want to undersell your yourself there, John. But uh, I, I definitely appreciate the insight. I mean, of course, uh, you have to be very well uh, aware of your qualities when applying to college and make sure you can highlight the the proper ones. Um, so that that's that's really really cool. Um, did you ever consider a career in physics afterwards or electrical engineering? Like I noticed that uh, just you know taking a gander at your profile. 
um, you worked for uh, a good handful of years as a developer. So how did you get into developing and why the pivot? So 100%, I really wanted to go into academia. Yeah, I like I like really, really, really wanted to. I actually started uh, in the PhD program at MIT mm. uh, after I graduated undergrad. I, I really wanted to go into academia because to me, yeah, I mean, so much like like to me, I'm motivated, I think, by discovery more than anything else. You know, mm. how do we do things that we've never done before and how do we explore parts of the universe that we don't understand? And so I, I, I was really captivated by that. I think academia, what ultimately led me away from it is that if you want to really change the world today... I don't think it's quite the same as it was 50, 100, 200 years ago, where kind of one person in a laboratory can really do that. Mm. I think it really takes a team, and I think it takes unified multiple people. And I didn't think academia maybe taught you that well. I think academia teaches you to be an incredible individual. I think it could do a better job teaching you how to be a leader and an inspirer. Mm. Um, and so that's why I moved away. But I'm going to be honest, some of the most brilliant, accomplished, humble, amazing people I knew were in academia. I got the chance to work under some professors that were absolutely incredible. I got the chance to work with peers that were brilliant. Uh, yeah, I, I really wanted to go into academia. I think in another life, I, I would have loved to be a professor. Definitely. I don't know, you? Like, do you have a lot of love for, like, academia? Or, like, I, I know you've, like, studied across a vast majority of places. Like, LSC, I know a lot of my friends were always interested and really wanted to go there. Like, I'm curious for you, did you ever want to go into academia or no? Not really. Um, yeah, I, I not can't, can't say. I mean, I really vibed when you said earlier that you took a very pragmatic approach to academics because that's exactly what I did. I just focused on just doing the best that I can and then trying to utilize other times that I had to create lasting relationships and friendships and just, you know, part of it just enjoy being a student, right? But uh, my my father was actually in finance. He was in business. He he worked a little bit in the hedge funds world. So I thought for the longest time I would go in the finance route. Um, I quickly learned that wasn't for me. And then I was kind of soul searching like most do in college. And then uh, at LSE, it was more, more focused in business and marketing and management. And that's kind of where I stumbled upon more sales, biz dev, marketing is kind of my thing. But yeah, um, no one in my family were academics. Uh, I 100% respect everyone, anyone in academia, uh, but I never saw myself to kind of follow in those footsteps. Wait, let me ask on that. It's funny. You mentioned in undergrad, you focused on kind of building connections with other people. Mm -hmm. See, it's so funny you mentioned that. So I wasn't smart enough to do that. <laughs> when I was in undergrad, I just thought it was about learning. I, I think I totally agree with you. I think some of the advice that I typically say is like, if I could go back to college, the one thing I'd do differently is I'd go to a hell of a lot more parties and I'd study a hell of a lot less. Right. Like at what period during life are you so surrounded by such a high concentration of brilliant people that are really going to do great things? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I resonate with that a lot. I, I, I'm I'm just lucky that I did that in college. I mean, I get really jealous when I meet people who are like, you know what? I have lasting friendships from middle school or high school and go way back. Um, I didn't. I didn't make any effort in high school to make friends. And I'm glad I did a little bit in college and then of course a little bit more in, in grad school afterwards. But yeah, I think college, the greatest value add is finding all these great people, putting them together. And then if you can kind of create relationships from that, I think you know, a lot of them can last a lifetime. I 100% agree. 100% agreed on that, particularly also the lifetime part. Yeah. But I did want to ask you, if you were to go back in time, would you have gone back to MIT? Or let me ask you this, John, was there like another university that you were about, almost about to go to? You're conflicted. You're like, is it MIT or is it X? So I'm not going to name the other one. Okay. I, I don't want to throw shade. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not about that, you know. Um, no, I think my father... Okay, I'll say a university that I did not get into because that's always a fun one. My father, after I got into MIT, really wanted me to go to, really wanted me to apply to Harvard. Mm -hmm. Not that I would get in and go, uh, but just so he could say that my son turned down Harvard because uh, he really wanted to do that. Unfortunately, they rejected me because mm -hmm. I was a little bit of a jerk during the application process. So I think I learned that one. No, I think I would go to MIT again. I don't think there was another school that was seriously in the running for second. I, 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 I liked the idea of MIT since I was a kid because I liked how nerdy it was. I liked how unique it was. I'm actually really saddened because I think the university is changing its ethos in a couple of ways on these fronts. Um, and it's and, and it's kind of scary to me. But no, I I, I think for me, I, I, I was pretty hell-bent on MIT from an early age. Well, let me ask you this. This is jumping a little bit ahead, but I, I you just kind of inspired me. So for a founder now of your own company that's growing fast, 
Um, do you feel a level of affinity or excitement when you see people coming out of MIT? You're like, oh my God, he's another MIT grad like me. Uh, do degrees and schools and caliber uh, academic institutions matter to you? Or are you all about, are there more important attributes um, than, than you know, whatever college you went to? So like, what, what is your perspective on that? So I, I love your question on this. I spent a lot of time recruiting. I probably spent half my life recruiting. Um, our criterion is that someone has to have accomplished something, <laughs> right? So if you apply to our company and we're looking at your resume, the goal is you need to accomplish something. That accomplishment can be broad. So for instance, getting a job at Google is 100% accomplishing something, right? Like, yes, it's not the end all be all, but it definitely takes some brains and wits to do it, right? Getting a, getting into MIT definitely takes something. Going into grad school at an incredibly good place definitely takes something. Starting a company or having a GitHub repository where you create some open source repo that like is very successful definitely takes something. So no, I don't think that I have a particular love for people who came from MIT or kind of a particular bias of that. I do think people at MIT are good at sussing out. Let's, uh, I don't want to use French here. So let's just say they're good at sussing out uh, non-legitimate statements or they're good at cutting to the heart of matters. Right. So one of the things that I really respect about the community is they kind of know what questions to ask to really kind of hit the nerve really quickly. Mm. Uh, and I think that that's a really good skill. I think that's an incredible skill because uh, I think a lot of life is filled with fluff. Mm. Um, so anyways, I, I would say that. So I, I get excited in the sense of like, I think I have a better idea over how that person, I have a better mental model over how to communicate with that person. And I have a shared vernacular with them. But I wouldn't say that I have a particularly massive bias one mm. way or the other. It's good to know. As long as, like you said, you put it aptly, like you, as long as you accomplish something, uh, it doesn't matter where you went to college. As long as it's something that, you know, they can be proud to talk about and, and something that you and the team can obviously be impressed about, then it's perhaps worthy of conversation. Yeah, 100%. Because I mm. think the reality, so it's funny because I have thought about this. I've actually, we've hired more people from my high school than we have from my college that I went to. And I went to school at a random high school, in middle Missouri. And you might think about that for a minute and be like, John, that's pretty crazy, what the hell? But it actually I think makes a lot of sense because the reality is that MIT teaches people to be incredibly brilliant, mm -hmm. but not necessarily to do whatever needs to get done to get the job done, right? The reality is a startup's a lot of unsexy work. I spent most of my morning today like talking to banks or like changing statements or like changing settings on different password applications, right? A lot of a startup is a very unsexy work and it's very unappealing work. Uh, and so I think that you need to kind of have a certain level of grit and a certain level of like, I need to still make it. Like I, I, I'm not there yet, right? I haven't succeeded to where I want to. Um, and so I think there's actually almost a negative bias over really mm. great universities because they almost disincentivize people from that attitude, mm -hmm. right? Like we have an interview during our process where we call it the project management interview which is effectively doing random things with people. It's like going on Wikipedia scavenger hunts, like start at pair and see how many words it takes you to get to like Barack Obama, right? Or go and see how quickly you can make like a Google Sheets and import a bunch of data and generate a bunch of graphs and do a bunch of things, right? The reality is that 90% of life is just doing random tasks and your B is B ability to do those things competently, effectively, and quickly, I actually think that's like the single largest predictor of success. Mm. Um, so anyways, that's 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 what I think I would say on it. We're like, I think MIT is an amazing bar because if you've done that, then it's unquestionably obvious that you have a certain level of talent. Mm -hmm. but yeah, the reality is talent's everywhere. And I would imagine you see that particularly in the recruiting world a lot. Like, I mean, just statistically speaking, you probably place people more from outside of top tier universities than inside of top tier universities, right? We do. And I, and actually, I think that's a great, uh, great fact that it's happening like that, right? And so pe people understand that there's a lot more to a person than what, what college you go to. Naturally, like, you know, as, as you talked about, certain types of colleges, whether it's like the recruiting or filtering the qualification or maybe some, some sort of bias or something in common that they have together, like that's totally something that I think uh, people should be aware of. But I think on the whole, yes, I, I think, uh, especially in our industry, depending on the type of positions they're recruiting for, um, there are certain other levers that are, you know, as important or even more important than obviously your academic background. Um, I want to, so you, you hired a bunch of people in Missouri from your high school. So were you just a really popular person in high school? Uh, and you just reached out to a bunch of old friends and then you're like, you know what, I'm done with socializing. I'm not going to socialize at MIT. Like how did that happen for a company now that's based at New York City? 
Uh, I appreciate your question. Yeah, it was honestly happenstance. Um, I don't think I was particularly popular in high school. I was popular because I, I was on I was on the debate team. Mm. Uh, I, I I talk probably too much. My girlfriend calls me a yapper. Um, so, anyways, so I was sorry. This is the stupidest joke I've done all day. Yes, yeah, so I was on the debate team, and our debate team was surprisingly really good. Uh, we had a debate coach, Jack Tuckness, who was absolutely incredible and just an amazing human. And uh, we we had a very close knit team. And from that, I think I got close with a lot of friends and other people mm-hmm. because it was a love of kind of doing a common thing that we did that we did pretty regularly. And I think I had more free time in high school than I did in college because college I was kind of busy trying to do different things. Um, so I'd probably say that's one. And then I would say two, which is when you it really started then happening by happenstance. So there was when we first started we realized, oh crap, like we just have a bunch of stuff that we just need help with, right? We don't need to hire the best developer in the world. Like we had tons of people that were coming to us and they were like, oh, I'm best, I'm a great developer. Like, can I work with you guys? And we were like, ah, like we really don't need a developer to do these things. We tried hiring someone local where we just kind of went out, tried to find someone smart and hire them. And unfortunately we realized very quickly that like we weren't good. Like we, we just were not good at identifying what skills were the most important skills to vet for because we never hired people before. So we didn't really know what to look for. And so we had a friend of ours outreach to us and say, hey, you know, I'd really love to work with you guys. And, you know, we met him for a beer, got together, started realizing this might be a click uh, and then brought him on. And then he kept in contact with other people from high school. And then mm. other people from my high school were like, oh, my gosh, I heard how fun it is. Can can I come too?" Yeah, that's how we ended up pulling quite a number of people. Uh, and so it's just it's a small world. Like, honestly, it's a small world. And I think the second statement is. And this is something that I give a lot of credit to, yeah, a friend of mine named Peter, who who now works with us. He was a friend of mine in high school. He's a very social guy. And I think because of that, he's just very good at kind of getting to know a network, Mm -hmm. getting to know an ecosystem. Um, And it's been awesome. I love it. I mean, what you said was true that you've spent a lot of your time recruiting even years before Floating Point Group. So, you know, you always have a plan B as a career, John, uh, after Floating Point Group. If you ever want a successful career in recruiting, I'm sure you can crush it with your skills that you developed over all these years. I appreciate that. Let me tell you, going back to college, I less P sets, more parties. All right. That's that. That's what we would do. <laughs> if uh, you heard it from when the founder at one of the co-founders of Floating Point Group, more parties, less studying at college. So if you're listening, heed that advice and perhaps you can end up having a successful career like John one of these days. <laughs> Now, I, I do want to ask a question, one more question uh, that touches upon the life pre-floating uh, point group or FPG. Um, I noticed that you, and I asked you this before, you how did you start working as a developer? Like, I know that you obviously studying physics and electrical engineering as someone who has a pension for obviously working closely with data and numbers. Like, did you just self-teach yourself how to code throughout college or before college? Like, how did you end up working as a developer? And then what did you think of, of developing and why aren't you a developer today? Or maybe you still are. Yeah, let's start. Let, let's start with that one. And then we'll go back. So I really love programming. I really love engineering. I love engineering for a couple of reasons. First mm-hmm. off, I get really nervous around people. Um, I just get nervous around anyone every time, like just talking, just any type of human interaction makes me very anxious. Coding is brilliant and beautiful because you can just do it in your own mind, in your own world, and you can ignore everything else. And to me, that's gorgeous. So I actually still reserve one day a week, actually Tuesdays today, uh, for getting to program the whole day and not talk to people. So I've gone to like one meeting today. I've sent maybe two emails, uh, but I get to program and I get to work on fun things all day. And I don't think that's useful for the company. I think the developers of our company would actually be more happy if I got out of coding. Uh, but the reality is I just kind of need it for my own sanity because mm-hmm. management can definitely be hard sometimes. Um, in terms of where I learned it and picked it up, yeah, that one I just learned when I was a kid. You know, the reality is in Missouri, there's not a whole lot to do. Uh, you can go cow tipping and play the game hostages. But outside of that, there's not that much fun stuff. So I picked up a book, uh, Introduction to Java Programming by David J. Eck, uh, and it was 12 chapters, and it was amazing. And I spent about a year doing it, studying it. And then uh, MIT, uh, MITx actually then came out my senior year, uh, or sorry, actually my junior year, that's right, uh, 6002, uh, Circuits and Electronics, taught by a knot. And effectively, I took it, 
And so I took this Java course, just kind of reading through the textbook and building everything and doing everything. And then on the side, I took a structured, more structured online course through MITx. And then third is I enrolled in an online high school. So I went to an online high school too. Uh, and yeah, I just, I just really loved like programming. I thought it was really, it's, it's just like an infinite world of expanding possibilities where any idea you come up with, you can make and you can build. So I would just spend a lot of time making fun things. I made drones that you could control with your hand, you know, back, back before like the really cool modern things, you know, would like move up. If you move your hand up left, if it goes left, right, if it goes right. Uh, I made a lot of things. I made rockets. I got really into rocketry for a while. So I made a lot of thrust simulators and things like that. We made missile simulators, made video games because I grew up on video games. Obviously, I had to make some video games. Uh, and then when I was in college, I got into machine learning actually pretty early. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know. Like now I, I say early now. It was like 2014, 2015, which I guess is considered early-ish. Um, cause I had an advisor, Max Tegmark, who was very brilliant and he really saw the writing on the wall with this stuff. And so he encouraged us to really go into it. And, uh, I did, and I started to see kind of the power of it. Um, and so from there, yeah, I just got a little bit more into data, realized you could take some of that, move it into finance, make a little bit more money in finance, started playing with that. And I'd say the rest is pretty much history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess I would say programming I just did because there wasn't many other things to do. And it's a very, uh, it's very easy. It's very simple. I think programming is one of the easiest of the hard sciences. Well, you certainly chose uh, a good thing to focus on in your spare time growing up. I mean, <laughs> you could have gone um, any other way, but then you chose engineering, which is obviously came in very, very handy when it comes to not only in our present day, but of, of course your career as well. What's your favorite language? You know, I'm going to give a different answer to this. <laughs> Are you language agnostic at this point? I think my favorite language of all time was TI Basic. I think that was my favorite language. It was so on the old calculators, the TI 84s, they had a language called TI Basic, which you could program programs in on your calculator. I love those calculators. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and I used to make programs and sell them to my friends to like answer all the questions on the test, right? So they could put in all the problems and it would easily generate it. And I think I spent hours and weeks, I would write down on a notebook. I brought that calculator everywhere because because no one knew, right? Those were back in the days. They wouldn't let you use phones or computers during class. So you could use a calculator. Uh -huh. so I would just program on my calculator in the back of every class, Spanish class, whatever class. And I really love that language. That language really fun. Wow. You know, you can also program games on it. I don't know if you had games on yours. Did you make any, did you make any special games? I did not make any, but I may or may not have used it, the calculator sometimes to competitively get ahead on quizzes and tests in middle school and high school. Yep, that was, <laughs> that's 100% synthetic algebra. Honestly, I forgot mm. about that thing entirely. And mm -hmm. it's very useful for that. The second thing is 100%. I made a snake, I think was the most. The snake, Yes. Yeah, that was probably the most common one that you Loved saw it. in the calculators. I don't even remember what the most common, I guess there was the ping pong ones. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was really fun. I I, I really love TI Basic. So I think it's absolutely fascinating uh, that you essentially self-taught yourself. So again, um, tying it back into just recruiting again, I'm, it just made me wonder. So how how do you feel about engineers today with like a proper official CS degree versus those that kind of like you got into the field untraditionally, or they're either self-taught or whether through boot camp or some other means, um, do you think one is better than the other or, or not? Like it's just a very dynamic conversation in our field. And for someone that like yourself is still coding to, to this day, and obviously you did, you probably honed a lot of development skills at college and, and beyond, but uh, you know, someone that literally picked up a book and then taught yourself. I mean, I, th I think that's incredible. So do you naturally connect and you're more empathetic to those that follow that same pathway? Um, or again, is it just, does it go back to, it's not about the school, it's not about the degree, it's about what you've accomplished from, you know, um, when you started career to now? Yeah, I think you have a great question, Preston. So I struggle with this really hard mm -hmm. because on one level, you know, as I was kind of mentioning before, I think the most important attribute that we look for when we hire people is their their shipping ability, right? Mm -hmm. Like, have they shipped something? So show me something you've shipped, whether that be a program, whether that be, I don't care, building something in your backyard, right? Show me something that you really designed, lived, breathed, and executed and built and shipped into the real world. The other side of that is the reality is that, like, it's easy to write code. It's hard to write sustainable code, Right. Uh, you know, like what the old stat, the engineers at Google write about seven lines of code a day. 
Um, I learned that firsthand because one of the first projects I ever worked on, it was a kind of a startup that I was trying to do called Fway Finance. And we built this system for executing financial transactions. And it was tens of thousands of lines. I think it was like 60,000 or 70,000 lines or something like that. It was pretty massive. And I wrote it all myself. So I was like pretty smart. And like, you know, I could like write it all. But I think I spent more time fixing bugs. And it would take me like 14 days to add a new feature to it mm -hmm. uh, than doing anything. Because because I didn't know that you were supposed to write tests. I, I didn't even know those were a thing. Uh, and I didn't really understand the documentation was a mm -hmm. thing. I didn't know that you were supposed to name your variables things other than data. So every variable was named data. And I didn't know that there was a difference between camel case and snake case. So I kind of just used whatever the hell I felt like in that line. Point is that I think there is an art and a skill to writing sustainable code. So to me, I think the best trade-off is the following. I think you want someone who knows how to write legitimate, real, scalable code. So the honest answer there is I don't think you learn that at university. I think you got to learn that on a job. Like I think you got to do that somewhere. And if you don't do that, then that's totally fine. But just be knowledgeable that the first six months, wherever you go, you're going to be spending time just learning how to write good code. Then I think beyond that, I don't think any of actual algorithms matter. I think it's just how you ship. So, you know, the other analogy I use is I'm an electrical engineer, right? I got a degree in electrical engineering from MIT. I never soldered at any point during my college experience. I never soldered. I never learned how to make a PCB. I never learned how to make a circuit. I didn't do any of that. Turns out you can get an entire degree in electrical engineering without doing any of that. Now, how that's possible, I don't know. But I do know that the reality is that what you do get a degree in and this idea of formal schooling doesn't exist. So whether you're learning it on a job or learning because of your own devices, uh, I think you're learning those skills in a multitude of ways. Mm. So, sorry, that was a little bit of a long answer. But I, I, I think what I would say is, Writing sustainable code is hard, and it's not nearly as fun as hacking. Hacking is super fun. Writing sustainable code sucks. So I think if you're a developer and like you want to you know, go into some place, I think you really need to realize that your first six months of having to program at some occupation is just going to show you that it's very different than programming by yourself. Because mm -hmm. right, like it's not as free, right? Like you actually have to watch your documentation. You have to communicate mm -hmm. with other people. You have to do all these things. And, and it's just like not that fun. Uh, the other way that I recommend people is if you just start a company and then get a big team and then your engineers kick you out of the code base, uh, <laughs> then you can just work on whatever the heck you want. Uh, and that's a really great system. So if you want, you can go that route. I love it. I love it. Now, I want to switch a little gears here. And, and uh, you did mention that the early days of, of your company, you guys started uh, or you were able to kind of accelerate your, your start at an accelerator. Uh, how important was um, the accelerator to the early days of floating point group success. Uh, would you, if you had gone in time, would you have, you think you guys would still get to where you are today without the accelerator? I know it really, some accelerators fast track you with the right relationships, the right investors and, and, uh, the, the, all the, the critical necess necessary kind of resources that'd be super helpful for companies and teams in the early days. So for those that are just unfamiliar, who are listening right now, who are unfamiliar with incubators and accelerators, whether it's a private one or through universities, we'd just love to kind of hear a little bit about your experience there and how you thought maybe it was super helpful for you guys. Yeah. So have a little bit of a unique experience on this because we were invited to be a part of several accelerators. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we, we've definitely looked at a lot of them. I think accelerators are very powerful in the early days because it shows that you're pretty serious about what you're doing, right? Like, uh, I, I have a criterion for investing in companies, right? Cause I'll, cause I'll angel invest in some small companies. Uh, I do not write big checks. Let's be very clear. Like 10 K is my like largest check I've ever written. And typically the very first criterion is are all the founders full time? Because mm -hmm. if the answer to that's no, then it's pretty much like, a, okay, you have a project, not a startup, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the minute that you all go full time, that's somewhat starting to be a real company, right? Like, regardless of whether or not you ever, you know, hire people or expand or grow anymore, if there are a couple of people and they are sustaining themselves, whether that be from their own savings or whatever, that's genuinely a startup in my book. I think an accelerator is powerful because it gets you in that mindset, gets you in that model immediately and does it in a very gentle way that I think a lot of people can go through. I think going cold turkey, quitting your job and starting something is a little bit of a scary prospect for a lot of people and for good reason. And I think you're exactly right that the connections are the second part. It's really hard to establish yourself in a new space and get to know people. 
right? When we first started in finance, very first thing we did, we looked at every alumni of our fraternity that lives in New York and works in finance, and we emailed them and just asked, can we have a meeting? Like, are you willing to hang out with us and talk to us about what you do? Uh, and the accelerator kind of multi multiplied our network beyond that. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'd say accelerators, you 100% don't have to do one. Functionally speaking, they probably hurt us more than they helped us. Like, the reality of starting a business is building a product, giving it to a client, and making money from that. Startups don't really optimize for that. They ask you, what are the long-term differentiation advantages? Or what is your long-term business model? Or what is the TAM? Those questions are irrelevant when you're trying to get started. You're trying, trying to get a dollar from someone. The most successful startup I've ever started, I did a couple of weekends ago where we went and stood in lines outside restaurants and sold our spot in line waiting for people, right? That's like an amazingly scalable idea that you can do immediately. An accelerator, like you will go for six weeks without making a dime. And I really doubt that you've learned anything about business, but I do think it's important for setting that precedent and giving you some of these industry connections. Mm. Did you guys get a little stipend just to kind of support yourself? Because I know a lot of accelerator programs are, they, they run like 90, 120 days, right? We did. So ours was a little different. Uh, so ours was put on by the school. So it was non dilutive. Mm. Uh, so we received uh, six grand personally for the summer. And then we received 20 grand for the entire company. Uh, so we didn't get much money. We effectively put it all in a big bank account, got mm. a three bedroom apartment, rented out the third room and lived in the other two. Uh, and we had that subsist on us until, yeah, that plus savings until we could like finally find investors plus a customer. I love that. I mean, thank you for sharing. I, I think it's very easy to, for a lot of people who wish to be a founder one of these days, or they just, you know, all they know about startups and technology are the movies or TV shows or the, you know, the crunch base of business insider articles that are just glorifying uh, the lifestyles of founders. But in, in the early days, it's difficult. You you have no idea if your company will succeed and you just have to be scrappy and lean and do exactly what you just talked about get a three bedroom apartment, rent out one and just be scrappy and lean and just work really, really hard. And I think it just, it just goes back to kind of what you shared before and how you're just very pragmatic. You're able to put your head down and put in the work. And I think um, the other co-founders are able to do that too, which is how you guys are where you are today. Um, so, so I think that's really cool. Funny you mentioned that, by the way. So yes, when we got our first check, so we went out and raised a seed round at like eight or 10 million, right? So, 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 so we did all right. And we only raised a little bit of money. We only raised like 200K at first. We didn't really raise much. Uh, but the valuation on paper said that, you know, our company was worth 8 million. And three founders, right? We like naively, you know, about a third, a third, a third each. So we were kind of looking there, all right, a third of 8 million is like $2 million. And some person just gave us a check that says our company is worth 8 million, right? That That's what just happened. So we were millionaires, right? But by golly gee, for dinner that night, we came home and opened up a can of baked beans and we had that for dinner. Uh, so it. yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a different experience. You mentioned that you were also entrepreneurial. You did some projects, uh, you, I think perhaps you even started, uh, other businesses before. How does it feel to be like a founder of a venture backed company? Like talk to me about like maybe the, just the psychological, maybe responsibility you feel, maybe pressure. How does it feel working for, you know, investors? What is that like real quick for anyone who's really curious? So I appreciate the question. My perspective on this is a little bit unique. So Floating Point Group, Wallace, we have external investors. They actually have very, very little kind of say or kind of oversight into what we're doing day to day. Uh, we've done pretty well financially speaking. And so because of that, we've been able to maintain pretty independent. Uh, and so so, so I'm kind of a little bit unique because we don't really have any board pressure, right? Like it's not like, like, oh crap, like when's the next fundraise? When's our exit event? Whatever. Most of the people that we partnered with, right, are either just really good friends, good acquaintances, et cetera. And we don't really have one particular investor that really stands out as like having like a major say, right? Um, so, so it's a little bit of a weird, right? Because I was in the offices of actually a really big uh, VC firm a while ago and I was in their boardroom and I was like, wow, I've actually never sat in one of these before. Mm. Uh, and so it was a unique experience for me. I think what I would say and where it does come in is I think as a founder, yeah, I, 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 okay. There's this like current thing going on, right, about chess, where I guess Magnus Carlsen versus someone else, like there's a concern of whether, whether the guy cheated, right? Um, and I think someone commented that like they think chess in the future, in order to stop cheating, because you can put microchips on people or you can point a laser, you can have someone in the crowd like wink or whatever. 
Uh, and so in order to stop cheating, they want to do like a contained room with both people naked, like completely search before and like really skin, right? And someone's kind of commenting that like, when you need that level of, we need that level of like skepticism mm -hmm. and right, like being nervous and paranoia, mm -hmm. it really breaks down society. So the reason I say that is I think it's similar to being a founder. The reality is that you get a lot of control. Like you can make a lot of decisions. Like you could do an additional stock issuance. You could decide to like, you know, liquidate the company for all of its holdings and stop. You could decide to completely pivot the company and take up and go a different way. So I think that there's a lot of the industry that's built on goodwill. Um, and so I don't think a lot of things are written down. So when you kind of talk about external investors, the way that I think about that is it's another group of people that I need to be cognizant of their interest, right? These people have said that they believe in us and they have given us money at a certain price point, a certain point. And it's my duty as the fiduciary to make sure that they get a solid return on that money, right? These are people giving us their first life savings. These are people giving us like a small check out of a larger portfolio. These are people that told me point blank, like when they asked me like, what are your long-term goals for the company, right? I have to tell them, okay, this is where we want to go. This is where we want to be. And I have to be able to like stand in front of them and kind of justify why we did or did not get there. So my whole point on this is saying, if the chess world doesn't need to go to the point of sitting in glass cages, right, and doing all this madness to stop cheating, I think the founder world similarly will continue to exist on a lot of promises. Mm -hmm. Promises that are a lot of unwritten, but promises that are really built upon just an industry of trust and responsibility and just interpersonal relationships. Um, it really comes down to relationships and trust. I mean, to just put it very simply. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, cause like, right. Like think about it when you're writing, say a safe or something like that, like you literally have no say, right? Like a safe literally gives you zero say until your shares eventually convert. And even when they convert, cause people don't really realize this, right? Like there's, when you convert, there's still multiple tranches, right? Mm -hmm. There's like major investor, minor investor, series A1, series A2, et cetera. And so the reality is that like, yeah, you, your opportunity for like speaking up is kind of like, you know, you going to, I'm trying to think of a really good example here. You going to BlackRock and saying that you have a problem with X, Y, or Z, right? Mm -hmm. Like the reality is that you're a small fish in a big boat. Um, and I think that's like kind of the way that people understand the industry. Yeah. Well. That's a great way to think about it too. All right. Let's uh, quickly shift gears and just talk about floating point group. So one more time, if you will, John, would you be able to just share in just layman's terms, like what does your company do? 100%. We help hedge funds and institutions trade cryptocurrencies. Hmm. That's really at its core we're about, right? Our mission is we're helping build secure and efficient access to cryptocurrencies. Uh, we do that in two ways. One, we help people with massive trades. So if you're a token foundation that has a billion dollars worth of some cryptocurrency, we can help you transact that. Mm -hmm. Or if you are some hedge fund that really needs to get in or out of some position, we can help you execute upon that. The other thing that we do is we help on settlement and prime financing. So if you don't want to open accounts on 20 exchanges, come talk to Floating Point Group. We'll give you access across that ecosystem, have it be more secure, have entitlements built on top of it, and have lower fee rates across the exchanges. At our core, we help institutions execute across these places, and we build secure and efficient access to cryptos. That's interesting, the second point, because what's the alternative of not using you guys? I, I would literally have to go to 20 different exchanges and go through the sign-up flow on every single one of them. So with, with you guys, I just do it once, one and done type of thing. 100%. Like, it's cool. terrible. You go and talk to a lot of these crypto funds, they'll be spending 40, 50% of their time on operations, hmm. right? They'll be spending it asking one developer to send money from this exchange over to this exchange so you can buy this token that's only traded over here. Hmm. Or it'll be some founder talking to some lawyer to try to set up a structure in some new place or new location to onboard with some different exchange that they've never worked with before. Right? And each one of these exchanges are non-standardized. Their technology is non-standardized. Their compliance procedures mm -hmm. are non-standardized. Right? So it's a lot of work. So you know, particularly if you're a small fund and you don't have an operations department that's that size, it can be really struggling for you. Mm -hmm. And then I think on the other side of it is if you even are a larger fund, the problem is these exchanges are not really set up to handle institutions. Right. Mm -hmm. Consider a Coinbase or Kraken account, right? They don't really have roles, right? You can't really have like an auditor and a trader and an approver and kind of all these different segmented kind of actions. 
And so that's another thing that we kind of put on top is we build an entitlement system where you could say, okay, well, I want these people to have to approve everything, right? Or if you're withdrawing more than a million bucks, I need two or three or four people to approve it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think at the end of the day, it really comes down to these exchanges, just the majority of their revenue is coming from the retail side and that's what they're built for. And so you really need another set of tools if you're going to target the institution. So the main users of Floating Point Group are institutional investors, correct? Is that like major funds, hedge funds? Do you ever think you're ever going to roll out some sort of vertical for the average retail investor, the average consumer? Uh, <laughs> or you, yeah. you, don't, you don't even want to go in that space and affiliate with that with crypto. I don't think so. I think okay. there are some parts of our tech stack where we've been interested in, okay, how do we bring this to a larger audience? Because I believe in the mission of crypto and I want to help further it. And I want to do that on a larger scale. Mm -hmm. um, but I think as of right now, we are much more likely to partner with institutions that support retail than we are probably to start offering directly to retail. Gotcha. I would imagine though, for a new young company like you guys to be able to get business and consumers, uh, especially if you know, you're know you targeting the funds, um, to be quite a, a, a difficult or maybe long or lengthy process if you want. I'm sure a lot of these hedge funds out there are getting pitched left, right, and center uh, with with the newest tech. So do you guys find that you're unique, unique enough where you can almost bypass that and it's actually a lot easier than you thought? Or um, did you put in a lot more effort than you thought initially to kind of get these initial conversations like kind of off the ground? I would say right now, this is going particularly well for us. Mm -hmm. um, I would say right now we've hit this really beautiful point where, you know, we really started to see a little bit of inklings of product market fit in different areas. Like we've seen, it's just really beautiful to be able to say that. Like, We've really been able to see a lot of customer conversations close a lot more quickly, uh, right? Like from first conversation, to actually signing up for our services. We've seen inbound increase pretty dramatically. We've seen just people willing to take a lot more meetings. So I would say actually right now, I would say our sales side is going incredibly very, very well, or at least compared to where it was prior. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how other companies are. I've only worked at one company, um, but I could at least say that I think it's going pretty well. I think that's kind of a factor of a couple of things. One, I think that's, I think it's us building a good product. I think definitely everything always starts with that, but I think it's us learning and being honest with ourselves about how people use our product mm -hmm. and our services. Um, Cause I think for a while we didn't totally understand all the clear use cases. So like for instance, sometimes we'll work with a hedge fund who just wants to do a lot of very active trading, right? Mm -hmm. Hedge fund that wants to buy something and sell something and buy something and sell something. And we work with some of those and, and we support them and they're great. But the problem is that they're not amazing customers because mm -hmm. if you think about it, a hedge fund lives and breathes and dies by how much money they make on every single one of those trades. And they kind of consider that some of their core competencies. So when you go and pitch them, you're kind of pitching against them, right? You're kind of saying, well, we can do it a little better. You know, we can sell this Bitcoin a little better than you can. And so we're going to help you out and do it, right? And if like you're a hedge fund and your core business is trading, you're probably going to look at us and say like, no, nah, I think we can sell it just as good. Um, so I think us then realizing, okay, well, maybe those aren't the greatest, but there's, you know, there's gaming studios that have tons of tokens that like their business isn't trading, but they still need to get money for them, mm -hmm. right? Or there's asset managers who their business is just making huge long-term bets. And, you know, those are kind of groups that we work with. Mm -hmm. So I think it's being more honest about what groups we're really good for serving and what groups we aren't. And we've seen that be very, very, very profitable and selective. You're definitely right that the ecosystem is competitive. It always is. It's financial services. Uh, but I'd say right now it's going pretty well for us. Mm. For uh, You said that your team has about 30 people now. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, we have about 30 people in and around New York. We have about another five kind of in California and in Canada. And then we have about six over in Singapore. That's amazing. What are your thoughts of in-office versus remote versus hybrid? Oh, my God. This is going to be the hardest question I have to answer today. There's no right or wrong answer to ease the pressure off, John. <laughs> well, how about this? What are you guys doing now? I would say right now we're doing hybrid. So effectively on Thursdays, we kind of have people kind of come into the office and say hi, kind of get together, sync up. Mm -hmm. And quarterly, we'll have the engineering team get together. And then we do retreats pretty regularly to kind of synchronize everyone. Um, our Singapore team pretty much goes into the office every day. We kind of have a group of about, I'd say, 10, 12 people that go in every day in New York. Um, I would be in the office today, but I've been feeling a bit under the weather. I don't know. I struggle with this. I don't know the right answer. And I really wish I could tell it to you. Mm. On some levels, I really would wish that we would go fully in person because 
I think I agree with what it was Elon Musk that said, oh, you can stay home pretending to work or whatever. Uh, I think I do agree that people probably work and are less responsive uh, when they're at home. Maybe I'm wrong with that, but I know that the responsiveness at least goes down. And so I know there's an image that people don't work as much. But if I think about raw horsepower, if I think about, say, an engineer, or I think about just my day or whatever, the reality is I'm a lot more productive when I stay at home. Now, maybe I'm not. Maybe that's not true. The other thing that being in the office is really good for is morale. I think it really helps people's morale and makes them feel connected and kind of together as a family. So anyways, I don't know. In some ways, I think it would be really great for us if we just all kind of went back every single day because I think morale, it would just be amazing for. Mm -hmm. But I balance that too, because A, like I think it has an impact on recruiting. A lot of people only want to join companies that are hybrid. And two is, I think you got to respect different people's preferences. Um, so I don't know the answer to your question. I wish I did, but that's kind of how I think about it. Yeah. yeah. You know, talking to many founders, we see them sprinkled across a broad spectrum. Uh, on one hand, you have founders that you said before, like, you know, as a founder, you have control. So some of them uh, are conflicted with, uh, with what to do with their team, but some of them just be like, you know what? I prefer in office. So my whole team is going to be in office. I prefer remote. So my whole company's remote. It is the lay of the land. Um, on the other hand, we have a lot of founders who are just constantly watching uh, what the market's doing, what others are doing, what big tech's doing, and just trying to um, figure out a solution that's best for the team, not just for the short term, but long term. And then obviously all the other companies fall somewhere in between. But um, I, I think recruiting, it's particularly interesting because for those that are fully remote, yes, like, you know, instead of just focusing on local talent, now you open it up to talent across the country or the world. Um, those that are still hybrid are still confined within the geographic limits of, of your local city. Um, but that shouldn't honestly have to be like a, a, a significant disadvantage. I think if, if your company um, has great legs, has a great business model and a great product, and it's an exciting space, like I think you shouldn't have difficulty hiring in any market that you're in, right? So, um, but I appreciate you just being honest and it, you know, it is a dynamic conversation or perhaps if I were to ask you again a year from now or two years from now, it might be the same, might be difficult, uh, different, but um, I, I definitely appreciate it. And uh, it's really cool that you guys are hybrid. Well, so hybrid means basically once, once a week in the office, is that correct? Pretty much once a week in the office for the people in and around the New York area. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, we kind of had a traditional policy where it's like, if you are not around New York, at least every month or every other month, come in for like a week or so mm -hmm. uh, and kind of do that. But yeah, I, I actually struggle with this one a lot. It's kind of one of those issues that I just kind of chuck under the bed and then don't really spend time on because mm -hmm. I feel like you can probably over-optimize it just the way you talked about it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. say la vie, you know? <laughs> say la vie. Why should somebody work and join Floating Point Group. Is there anything particular that you guys do that are unique, X factors, benefits? Um, you know, if, if there's one thing to really just get excited about, what would it be? Aside from working with you, John. First, first off, like there's a lot of hella nice places to work, right? There's a lot of really incredible, it, there is a couple of really crappy places to work and I'm not gonna name those, but let's just be clear. There's a lot of people on both sides of the spectrum. I think what we've done really well is we're very much family people group mm -hmm. um, where I think that we all are kind of a family. Uh, so we have like a channel for memes where we're like constantly sharing memes with each other about different things. Uh, effectively, every person on the team has a uh, icon in Slack. Uh, sorry, I should be more clear. It has it has one of the react emojis in Slack. And so we're kind of constantly using those to respond to different things that kind of mean different things. Um, and we just kind of spend a lot of time like getting to know each other and kind of spending time as a family. So I'd say that we really build a very congenial, nice family atmosphere. Secondly is, I'm going to be a little bit biased here, but if I were to think on behalf of someone's shoes, like, what are you looking for in this world? I think people are looking for a couple of things. First off, you want to be a part of something big, right? You want to be a part of something growing. Well, we're 40 people. We've been 10Xing every year for the past couple of years. I think we have a pretty good trajectory. I think we're working on some pretty good stuff. And I think we have some pretty good software and some pretty brilliant people. So... I, I think, yeah, you have the chance to join something that, at a pretty small stage uh, that I think is growing pretty rapidly. Secondly is I think you want somewhere that challenges you, that teaches you new things and forces you to work very quickly. Well, in a 40-person company, you pretty much have to wear every single hat in the book. 
Uh, there are people on our team that help with the finances and also do all the recruiting. There are people on our team that will do all the software development, but then have to trade on the weekends. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think if you're looking for something where you have to get exposure across a lot of things and learn, I think that we've done a pretty good job optimizing for this. And I think the last thing I'd say is you owe it to yourself that wherever you go and work, you get the chance to learn uh, just about how companies work and the inner workings of them and what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And we spend a lot of time teaching people about like, okay, these are the core components of a startup. This is how we started. This is the core things that we do. Um, yeah, we've even had some alumni of ours like go on to like start additional companies and kind of do more things, even like though that we're pretty small. Um, so I think the reality is that, yeah, I think we've done a pretty good job creating a culture as a family, creating a culture that is incredibly high paced and very demanding. And then I think third is, I think we've done a good job of making sure that it's teaching along the way, right? It's very like academic in nature. We're very disciplined. We're like, okay, these are the considerations. And we're very transparent about most things, right? You can find posts online from myself about how we think about compensation, about how we think about our competitors. You can go to our website and like pretty get an accurate data dump of like, what do we do? And kind of actually, who do we serve? And kind of where do we go? Um, so, so I'd say that like we've, I don't know. I, I would like to say that we've created an incredibly intentional and well thought out culture. And I think we benefit from that strongly. Certainly. I mean, you you definitely mentioned a handful of things there that I personally vibe with and, and you can easily focus on when it comes to recruiting or just getting your narrative out there. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm glad you brought up comp real quick, John. So like, just real quick, what, what are your thoughts on just comp and being fair uh, in this very competitive market, growing a company in New York City? Because there are a lot of companies around your stage and smaller that are still following the whole uh, the founders kind of mindset, like, Hey, I want to attract the right person. And because of that, I want them to get excited about the equity and we want, we're okay. Giving them like a very low ball, you know, relative to market salary. Uh, and then there's on the other hand, uh, equal amount or more companies, uh, similar to your size again, or smaller, like, you know what, like this market is insanely competitive. And we understand that salary is a big component to a lot of people when it comes to deciding where to work. And we want to do whatever we can, even though we are against bigger, more established companies, like, and big tech with, you know, bigger, deeper pockets. So like, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So the very first thing to say about this is every company in the world should be spending time thinking about their comp philosophy, how they think about it, how they target it, how they go about it. Um, I have a good medium post on this. If there's any early stage founder out there that wants to think about like, how do we think about our comp philosophy and our comp structuring, please feel free to take a look. I spent a lot of time kind of putting it together and structuring it. And I think I did a pretty good job. Yes. So I think the very first thing is you need a comp philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, one of our core tenets of our comp philosophy is that we're highly intentional with our comp. So we're very structured with the way we do comp. We do comp reviews twice a year. Uh, and we effectively, during both those times, benchmark against both the market, look at everyone's, understand kind of where things are at, et cetera. Um, we also, during those, look at how much have we been losing offers to comp or kind of where's our target for that, right? And generally speaking, our ratio is pretty good. So I'd probably say, I think the number was like around 80%. So 80% of our offers or personnel things like never involve comp, right? The reasons why people join us or, you know, the unfortunate reasons why people might leave, right? This has nothing to do with comp in at least 80% of cases, right? Which, which to me is like a good benchmark, right? Like, okay, maybe we could like change the way we're doing this and increase that to 90, but like, eh. Um, our comp philosophy has about four key tenets. We are sustainable in the way that we compensate. So effectively what we do is we benchmark to 75th percentiles of the market um, and then split that based on equity and cash and then give people a range of offers where they can choose whether or not they want higher cash or higher equity and they can kind of sliding scale that as they want. So we are very, very, very sustainable, right? So like we're 75th percentile, not about to do 90th percentile. We don't negotiate with things like, like we are, we're, we're pretty structured with this. The second thing is actually exactly to that point, we don't negotiate with things. Um, so this is like more of a kind of personal thing here, but I just feel really icky whenever people join. And if they negotiate, they get say 10% higher or 10% lower. Um, and then you start getting these really bad games where you're like, oh, well, you know, if they actually asked for a lower salary, but we were going to give a higher one, do we just give them a lower one? Because like, ah, eh, well, that's how much they're asking for. Um, I think all that's like terrible. I think it's really icky. So we just don't negotiate. It. So we're pretty intentional about the way we construct these offers. We give people the offer. People will very regularly ask, hey, can I negotiate? And then we will send them a very long email to explain to them that they, we do not negotiate. Um, and again, like sometimes we will lose candidates from that, but in 80% of cases, we don't. Uh, and so I'm okay with that because it means I don't have to negotiate, which is great. Uh, and so that's our second thing. 
Uh, the third thing about it is that, yeah, we're highly, highly intentional with our compensation. Um, and so we just spend a lot of time thinking about it. We publicize about it. We talk about it. Uh, we share with people about it um, and we go about it. Um, and then lastly is, and this is going to kind of sound silly, silly, but I think it's true. We compensate based on the value that one provides, not the level of experience they have. Right. So we have people in the company that are pretty junior, that aren't managing anyone and they're just ICs. Uh, that make more than managers in the company or other people, right? We compensate to the level of value, not to the level of experience. Um, and so, yeah. So I guess what I'd say is compensation, be highly intentional with it. I don't think it's actually as big of a thing, particularly now that the market's cooled down. I don't think it's nearly as bad. And I think it's just going to get better because, you know, the government's just trying to make more unemployment right now. So go team when they do that, you know, comp will always come down. Um but that's high level, I think about it. Yeah, yeah no, I, I love it. And, and I think the fact that you are intentional about it sets you apart from many others. And also just the fact, the simple fact that like, it's the easiest thing companies have control over. Yeah, it, it really is. And and you're like, you know what? I don't, I don't want this to be part of the discussion at all. So rather let's just be fair and go high. And I, I'd rather you do that and and no, and not negotiate than giving a salary that's like 40% of the market and not negotiate, right? So I'm, I'm glad you're in the former camp and and not the latter. But a uh, couple more questions here. I know we're, we're slowly Please. kind of wrapping up on time, but this has been great so far. Um, I know this is a, this could be a banger of a question, but I, I do have to ask you considering, you know, the space that you guys are in, what are your personal thoughts as to the future of just blockchain and Web3 and crypto? Uh, pessimistic. Let's go with that. Pessimistic uh, like, as a co-founder of a fintech company in the crypto space. Yeah, yeah. Well, all right. Let, let me explain. Let me get context. First off, I'm optimistic on our business. I think our business. Is okay. All right. Let's be clear about that. Um, I believe in what we're doing, and I actually I, I'm optimistic. I am. I think any technological innovation innovates two things. Mm -hmm. I think it provides new technology and new ways of doing things. And I think it provides new ways for society to think about things, mm. right? I really wish I could think of a good example of this, but I can't think of a good example for this. So say la vie, so I'll just use crypto. Crypto generated a really cool technology that can really transform the way we live. The idea that we no longer need a central intermediary to back every transaction that I send to you or that you send to you know, whoever, that's a really beautiful thought. And that's a really beautiful system. And the idea that we can create this kind of universe of this computing power that you can purchase and decentralized kind of use and decentralized access to that, that's that's really amazing, right? That That's really a, a step forward for humanity. Unfortunately, though, I, I, I don't think any of that will be used uh, because I think the reality is that crypto offers a pretty bleak future for the, for, for the world because it's very Orwellian, right? The reality is that the government right now, if I give you 20 bucks and I pay you, I'm like, ah, Preston, thank you so much for letting me on that podcast. Here's the hundred bucks I owe you. Um, hypothetical, you know, I, 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 but anyway, uh, if I did that, right, like the government wouldn't technically know, mm -hmm. but yet if I send you a hundred dollars of Bitcoin and the government insert all their monitoring here that they want to do, they're a hundred percent going to be able to see that and know that. Right. So I actually think crypto is really, really, really bad for personal privacy and personal mm -hmm. liberties. And as a strong libertarian, I am saddened by that. And I'm very nervous about that. I'm also nervous about this idea of decentralized computing being used at large scale, because I think you're seeing more and more large conglomerates, like economies of scale are pretty much always going to win out, right? Like proof of stake versus proof of work can be pretty much summarized by the statement of like, it never made sense for people to be mining in their basements because they didn't have economies of scale. So then they moved to working out of these massive data warehouses, mm -hmm. and then people were spending massive amounts of money in order to do all these things, right? And so the reality is, I think crypto will take over the back end of the world. I think when JP Morgan wants to send money from here to Korea, they're going to use crypto. Mm -hmm. And I think when you go and buy a house, your deed is going to be on the blockchain. I don't think title insurance is going to exist. That industry is insane. Every time you buy a house, someone has to write down who now owns the house. And if they write it down wrong, you have to buy insurance for that because sometimes they write it down wrong. And I think that's insane. And I think that should be NFT. And so, and I think all stocks will be tokenized and put on the blockchain. I think all voting will be done the same way governance is done in crypto. So I think on the back end, crypto is amazing. And I think it's going to change the world. And I think it's going to make it a lot better. But I don't think it's going to change society. And I think it's because of that that I'm so pessimistic and saddened by it. So for those that are deep into Bitcoin and are hodling and are hoping that the crypto winters are over, 
Are, are you thinking that there's the crypto blizzard right around the corner or they might have to go and uh, put on another kind of snow jacket to, to stay warm for years no. to come? I think Bitcoin, yeah, I, I, there's definitely going to be more winters. I think today, <laughs> even crypto dropped by about 10 or 12%. But mm -hmm. granted, everything did because of CPI. I think cryptos will continue to exist in their current state. I think the major cryptos, like insert top 10 here, uh, I think those will probably retain their value because they're just going to be seen as investing assets. Mm -hmm. I think most other things are going to depreciate at some point pretty mm -hmm. heavily. Um, and I think eventually they're going to have to find their uses. I just don't think they've found them yet. Yeah. Um, but they're working on that. I think there's a couple of exciting projects. I think Avalanche is pretty exciting. I think Hashgraph is pretty exciting. And Hedera is very exciting, I think. Uh, and then I also think that Algorand is pretty exciting with a lot of their zero computing stuff. Um, and I think a lot of the ApeCoin stuff is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So I think a couple of blockchains that I'm pretty excited about, but I think vast majority, like, yeah, it's pretty scary. All right, couple a couple final questions. So moving forward, what sort of positions uh, will you guys be hiring for? And so if anyone listening uh, who are, you know, like, you know what, I'm vibing with John. I think he's a cool guy. I think he's a cool person I would love to work with. And I vibe with Floating Point Group's mission. Maybe I'd love to join one day. What are some positions that you think you'll be hiring for in the future and how can people apply? Uh, if anyone's vibing with me, please send me a note, john at floating.group. And I'm happy to chat. Uh, I always love to meet people. Um, 100%, what are the roles we're going to be focusing on? So first and foremost, right now, we're looking for backend engineers. Um, so this is effectively global. So no matter where you are, 100% would love to chat. Uh, kind of both junior and senior here, junior directly out of college, not even graduated college, perfect. Um, senior engineers, a little bit more on the senior side. Uh, both sides of that, 100% really looking for. The only roles outside of engineering too is uh, we're specifically looking for kind of a director of finance and a trust uh, officer as well. Um, so if those are things that maybe you're interested in or interested in exploring, 100%, please shoot me a note, John at Floating Dot Group or recruiting at Floating Dot Group. And I'd love to chat. And make sure you fine print that you're either from Missouri, you live in Missouri, or you went to MIT, you know people in MIT, uh, so that it directly goes to John's attention. Um, and then Next question. So for, for users, if, if someone's listening, like, you know what, I actually own a fund, or I might know someone who owns a fund who might be a great user for your company. Like how can they also reach out? Is it floatingpointgroup.com? Um, how do they, what, what is like the flow onboarding flow look like? So our website's floating.group, um, floating but group. alternatively, you feel free to email us. Uh, our email is team at floating.group. Feel free to shoot us an email anytime uh, and you'll kind of get us a note to us. Our Twitter handle is floating point group. And our LinkedIn too, you can find us there, Floating Point Group. Uh, and so, yeah, we'd love to kind of chat in any different way. I love it. And I think like we always do, John, to end these podcasts, uh, first of all, I just want to thank you again. I mean, this has been amazing. It's been so much fun, uh -huh. super insightful. I mean, you could make a podcast alone about just crypto or just about your experience at MIT and Missouri. I would love to have... Uh, had another chance to deep dive. Perhaps we can do another one in the future. This has been great. But uh, I want to ask you um, for someone who aspires to be, to follow in your footsteps one of these days, whether it means like have a successful career, um, whether it means like creating and becoming a founder one of these days of a, of a tech company, what is like one advice that you want to give to those that are listening? Live your life as a series of stories. Just find the most interesting things and go for them and do them because chances are those are the things that, yeah, will end up being most fun and change the way you see the world. I love it. I mean, life is a combination of stories and chapters. And you were able to just clearly demonstrate that with your life from Missouri to MIT to going from physics to electrical engineering to development and then to crypto to trading. And now you're you're a founder in New York City. Um, and well, so it is exciting to see what you and your team will do moving forward it's it's exciting to see i think for someone with a breadth of your background and your experiences john uh perhaps it'd also be exciting to see 10 20 years down the line maybe what you also has in store for you perhaps after floating point group with someone who so many interests and skills um and ones that are just very unique others that are just very tangential but you know i think I definitely uh, am grateful for you taking the time and sharing your experience. I certainly have learned a lot and I'm sure people who are listening have learned a lot too. And if you are listening, make sure uh, you check them out. You can feel free to reach out to John. Um, and if you are somehow um, 
vibing with all this and you're excited and you want to work with the team one day, feel free to also reach out to them as well. But uh, John, I just want to thank you again. It's been, it's been fun. And for someone who has not that many experiences on podcasts, I think you should be a regular now. Like you're, you're just a natural. <laughs> this is great. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Preston. Thanks everyone. I really appreciate it and have a lovely rest of the day. You got it. We'll keep in touch.